Testing, testing. Yep, cool. All right, we should be good. Has anyone been watching the recordings? What do you mean you tried? I don't understand. What, what, did you get lost or something? Did you end up watching weird videos on YouTube? Oh, no, they're not on the learning place. Um, they can't go on the learning place because of the file size. So. OK, so data processing and error analysis. Like I said, we're going to start with a brief review of some of the basics. OK, so very quickly, let's just remember as a bit of a review how to do an average. Average. So we've got x bar generally is how we'll communicate that we're talking about an average. And it's just sum of all xn's over the number of values. Now you should remember this from maths, from early science. This is nothing uh, to, to have as a problem. Now, um, I'm going to switch to blue periodically when I'm using values from our uh, ball drop experiment example. Okay, So every now and then, you'll just see some numbers pop into existence as we re-look uh, at these formulas and everything. And that's me switching to talking about actual values from a, a, a mock experiment. Yeah, we are going to have to come back to that. Yeah, sorry, I should have been more cl clear about that. I did, you were away for it, but I did quickly mention um, we do still have these examples to go through, guys, from previous lessons. And we are definitely going to come back to them uh, momentarily before we move on at the end of this week. Um, so if you are not fitting this in three columns, I did speak briefly before we did our exercise, I think, um, to make sure you're leaving space. If you're not fitting this in three columns that are parallel along your page, then if you're doing them horizontally, you know, you might need a couple of pa a page at least sort of thing. Um, the good news is example two and example three will be the shorter examples. Example one is the longest one. Example two and three will be trickier, but we won't do as many variables. We won't investigate every possible thing that you can solve for. Um, we'll just do one for each to identify those key differences between those cases. Anyway, we will, we will come back to that. Um, for now, don't stress about it. This is just case one that we're covering here, where our launch height and our landing height are the same. Okay, so our Y displacement should be zero across the total uh, time of flight. Obviously, there is that important key piece where we're going to have some maximum Y displacement. Don't forget that. That could come up. Um, okay, so let's get back into this. Um, this is going to be for the ball drop experiment where we recorded the period of time um, for our drop, and we uh, compared that to how high we were dropping it from. Okay, um, In this, our X uh, value or our actual values that we're looking at are actually our time, um, our time values. So this will be the sum of all t values from our trial, from trial one, two, and three, or whatever, and divide that by n, which is going to, in this case, we're going to get an average of, um, or I'll, I'll do the whole process, I guess. Um, t1, that's the first time, plus t2, plus t3, divided by three. There's three n's there. And in this case, we end up with, I don't know, 6.1 plus 5.8 plus, let me make this a nice neat number, 5.7, 5.8 again. 5.8 again. 5.8 again. Divided by 3. And that should give us 5.9 as an answer. 5.9, 5.9, 5.9, yes, cool. Okay, so that's our average for this experiment. Our average T value, T bar in this case, we're talking about T bar. Generally, we'll use X bar to refer to the average of some value. Um, but here we're talking about T bar. Um, so T bar is equal to 5.9. Now, the other quick thing to recap is trialed uncertainty. Trialed uncertainty. Again, this should be things we're familiar with, so I'm not going to give every specific detail around this. If there is something you get a bit lost about, please do just say, hey, what's that? Where'd that come from? Remind me again. 
um, trout uncertainty, and this is going to be an absolute uncertainty. Of course, we can always convert percentage, uh, sorry, absolute uncertainties into percentage uncertainties, um, but we're talking about absolute uncertainties here. We're going to calculate the actual difference, in this case, in seconds. That's the other thing we should include over here, sorry, our units of seconds for that one. Um, so our trout uncertainty. How do we calculate trout uncertainty? Yeah. Um, remember your little uh, symbol here? I believe we've been using... No? Not delta? Sigma? Is that right? <laughs> what's, what's in your formula and data book? Remind me. Uncertainty symbol. What are we using? It was the first one? The delta? Lowercase delta? Yeah? Okay. Cool. Um, and the little plus or minus beforehand? Little plus or minus beforehand. <clears throat> and of course, if you're talking about a percentage uncertainty, you can chuck a percent sign on this to communicate that. We are not talking about a percentage uncertainty right now. We're talking about our absolute uncertainty, the actual value. And we're going to find that by doing x max minus x min divided by. Okay, so that's going to take that leeway either way from our average. Um, in our examples case, that will be 6.1 minus 5.8 divided by 2, which is 0 0.3 divided by 2, which is going to be 0 0.15 seconds. And that's a plus minus absolute value. Now, if we think about that as a percentage uncertainty for a moment, and you can quickly do that calculation. Uh, you would do 0 0.15 divided by your average Okay, your uncertainty divided by your average value times by 100, pardon me. Um, you're going to get, what, 0. 0.15 divided by 6. What's the numbers there? Like 0. 0.6 would be 10%. So it's a quarter of 10%, so 2.5% uncertainty or something like that. You guys can grab your calculators and quickly check that. Um, but you're looking at a pretty reasonable percentage um, uncertainty, nothing major. Uh, you, you will sometimes deal with much larger than that. But if you imagine, because we're going to get towards error bars, if you imagine this as a percentage, yeah, if your time is that big on your axes, right, it's, you know, 15 seconds or whatever, and you're talking about 10%, it should make sense as far as the length is concerned. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, our time will be on our y-axis, as was the case with the bull drop experiment. Um, so let's get into that. Um, let's quickly... Gr graph this data. I think a couple of people are still jotting things down. Yep, so a little bit longer for that, but then we are going to graph this data. So if you want to start setting yourself up to draw a very a neat, perfect graph, please, um, you might want to grab your rulers out of your pencil cases. Give me an X and a Y axis. Now we're going to go to, um, on our Y axis, we're going to be doing time. We're going to go to about 10 seconds. On our X axis, we're going to be going, uh, doing distance. And we're going to go to about 10 meters. I don't think that's going to work, actually. Don't do 10 seconds. Do... Go to 10 seconds, go to 100 meters. So go up in 10 meter intervals. I'll start it now. You good, Henna? Someone you can copy off? Yeah, cool. Now, I'm going to uh, probably wind up doing some annotations on this as we go, okay? So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this for the example that we're considering, and then I'm going to 
annotate that with the general rule that I'm employing to decide how to do that, okay? Uh, if you wanna try and leave yourself some space to annotate as well, generally on a graph it's pretty easy because there's gonna be a lot of empty space, right? We're just gonna have a couple of data points and a line. Uh, you should have empty space on there. But if you wanna leave yourself a column on the side or space underneath or above, just make sure you can fit any annotations in there. Oops. That's not terrible, but we can do better. We can do better. Good enough. All right, now mine's gonna be a little bit messy as always, guys. I still have not figured out how to do good rural lines on this, um, but we're gonna have a y-axis and that's gonna be our time, yeah? Our y-axis is gonna be our time. Our x-axis is going to be our distance. So this will be distance or displacement. Displacement in meters, and it's going to be going to 100. Um, I would encourage you to go up in tens if you can, if you've given yourself enough space to write that in a legible way. Alternatively, twenties. I'm just going to keep things simple uh, up here for you guys. It's going to be 10 seconds because this is. Oh, we really don't need our units on each individual value. Better convention is just to give the number and the units on the label. This will be time, if I can go sideways here, time. And that's in seconds. It'll be 10. Up in twos. Uh, five. Two. Four. Eight, nine. All right, so we're looking okay here. Bit of a graph. Um, now, generally, when balls are dropping, um, they start off dropping at zero meters per second. After one second, they're dropping almost 10 meters per second. So in one second, they generally drop five meters. Let's do that as a rough rule. After five seconds, they've dropped 25 meters um, it becomes a little bit higher than that or a little bit less than that actually um, but basically we're going to have every two seconds every two seconds our displacement out there out there a bit before 25 six seconds we were dropping about 50 meters and again, I'm, I'm totally, this is not, I'm not intending this to be real data, guys. This is not what you would necessarily expect. Uh, it is to make a point purely. Oops. Okay, so quick annotation off to the side here. Generally, We are looking for a linear trend. So, generally we're looking for linear trends, okay? Now, if you guys remember back to this ball drop experiment, you know that the distance you fall does not equate linearly to the time that it takes. This is an accelerating object, which means it's actually related by some constant to the time squared. And when we originally did this experiment, we had to square our time to linearize our results. And then we could map a trend line that was linear to those results. 
However, um, what a bunch of you found is sometimes you can just grab a trend line. I'm going to go orange for my trend line here. And you can try to map a trend line, maybe a little bit more like that. You can try and map a trend line to data that probably looks pretty clear. Now don't copy down this next part that I'm going to do where I'm going to mock up some fake error bars. The reason we often start with a linear trend line and a lot of you on your student experiments, um, whether in my draft or perhaps as feedback in, my, in your final if you didn't correct it previously, I called for you to always fit a linear trend line first um, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for things that are directly related. Um, Linear, linearly related, because then we can just come up with a constant. We can say this is equal to that times by our constant value. It's a direct relationship. It's nice and easy. Um, but sometimes we fit a linear relationship to data that looks clearly curved, but then we do an analysis of our errors. And we're like, well, you know what? Our uncertainty was so high that this could be a linear trend. It looks like it's probably a curve, but every single point of our linear trend line falls within the uncertainty of our actual data collected. So it's plausible that our results are subject to some random or systematic error, but are actually describing a linear relationship. That's entirely plausible. Does that break anyone's brains a little bit? Is anyone a bit weirded out by that? Or does that sort of make sense? Right? Because the idea of uncertainty is, yeah, we got that value as our average, but we got values down here, we got values up here. It could have been anywhere between there realistically. Right? We're not precise enough with our experiment here to say for sure that this is not a possible result, this trend line. Okay? Now, in this example here, we calculated an error, like I said before, of about 15%. Okay, so we're talking about if this is 10, uh, sorry, it wasn't 15%, it was 0.15, right? Uh, a tenth, a tenth. So one tenth of that or one fifteenth of that. So a tiny little margin of the distance between one second and two seconds, right? Um, so it would look something more like this. And this is probably a lot more realistic to the sort of error bars you'll be dealing with. In quite a few experiments, especially towards electromagnetism, you'll probably find error bars are a waste of your time because you get errors in the percentages of half a percent. It's tiny. Um, your, your experiments become incredibly precise. So with this being the case, we can very clearly make a statement that that trend line, and I hope no one's copied any of these colored things down yet, <laughs> we can very clearly make the case that this trend line is not, not worth assessing that we should move on from the idea that this is linear, it's not. And we can immediately go and fit a curved trend line. Now, generally, the only other trend I would be looking for is a power of two, a quadratic, a parabola of some sort. And that's going to obviously, for obvious reasons, come up a lot in projectile motion, yeah? Um, so we can actually try to fit a curve to this. Um, doing this, Hand-drawn is obviously tricky and complicated and mostly incorrect. Um, doing this on a computer, though, can be quite easy, right? You go polynomial order two on Excel, and it will very quickly try and match uh, a polynomial to that and tell you whether it's a polynomial relationship or not. Um, those of you who are doing high levels of uh, mathematics, you will actually look at um, how you can take you know, two or three points, a turning point, another point, whatever, and calculate backwards what your equation would be. Is that a year 11 assignment or year 12 these days? I can't remember. Is, are you trying to match a river or a wine glass or something? Year 11, you did the wine glass, right? Yeah, yeah. So you would have had to calculate what a function was based off some sort of conditions, you know, start here and here sort of thing. So, so you can actually do this with a trend line as well. Um, and that's basically what Excel does, and it looks at the R squared values of those and tries to find the optimized R squared. Um, but we are going to, in this experiment, be asked to do a curved trend line. Generally, I am against them, but there are times where it's obviously not a linear trend, and we should show that very clearly by a nice smooth curve. The only rule with that is similar to a linear trend line, you should be starting um, 
sorry, you should have half of your values above and half of your values below, and you should be close to your start and end values primarily, okay? The start and end values are the best way to sort of set the gradient for a linear trend. Similarly, with a the curve, they're the best way to sort of set that curve, and then you can shift that up and down based off uh, fitting half above and half below. It's obviously a lot trickier, and it doesn't have to be perfect, so don't stress about that too much. Okay, um, so let's just make a quick note about that. Um, when a linear tw trend, trend, a linear trend is clearly not appropriate. You may consider curved trend lines. However, you should still linearize. So, so what I mean by that is when we get this first data, time and displacement, we can see, yeah, look, that's not a linear trend. Let's not bother putting a linear trend line on that. We can show that it's quite curved or we could fit a linear trend line, show that it doesn't match our error bars and then move on. We are moving on with the goal of finding what the relationship is by linearizing. So we move on to our next graph where we linearize that data and we get a linear trend line. Okay. Your last trend line that you do for an analysis or interpretation of your results should not be curved. You can map a curved trend line, but it should not be the last thing you say because it's very hard to communicate what the relationship is based off a curved trend line. Even if it's XL and it gives you the function, that doesn't, that doesn't help us understand the true nature of that relationship. and doesn't help you map it to theory either. So look at squaring that x value, look at uh, different manipulations of it to see what you can do to linearize that. Um, lastly, let's uh, include our error bars. Um, and I'm going to do a really gross exaggerated example here. So up here and up here, right? This distance here from that point to there is our uncertainty, plus minus. That's what that distance is there, right? And then this distance from here to here is plus minus our uncertainty. Realistically, of course, one of them is plus, one of them is minus. We could actually, um, you know, rather clearly say that. That's what your error bar is, all right? And again, more realistically, they're often going to be niggly little things here. Um, when they can get quite large is when we propagate them. And that's why propagation of uncertainty is so important. Yeah, um, If you're multiplying percentage uncertainties, they can start, or adding percentage uncertainties, they can start getting up there pretty quick. Unless you're doing electromagnetism, in which case you probably won't have to worry. Okay. Error bars, and we can do a little annotation here. Um, error bars are going to come from absolute values. There's, uh, it, I mean, you can use a percentage uncertainty, but you just have to find what the absolute uncertainty is anyway and measure that. So absolute uncertainties. Let's space this out well. Now, I've said absolute uncertainty for error bar, not trialed absolute uncertainty. You can do this for a measured 
absolute uncertainty. Remember, there's a difference, yeah? We can measure something and know that we're inaccurate to half a centimeter, right? So we might also know that we have some error consistently across these in the displacement we've measured. Because sure, our ruler said it was 50 meters, but our ruler is pretty inaccurate. It went to the nearest 10 centimeters. It was one of these big old wooden ones so that we could get tall enough, right? We're going up to 100 meters here, you know? Up in a crane, dangling a tape measure, there's a fair bit of uncertainty for that. So we can also have um, an absolute uncertainty that's not trialed, but our, um, you know, measured absolute uncertainty could also give us error bars. Cool. Here's a question. Would your error bar ever be uh, uneven on either side? When? Why would you have a greater plus delta than a minus delta? In year 11, there is no situation that it should ever come up. In year 12, I can't think of a situation that it should ever come up. If your error bars are uneven, you've possibly done something wrong. Yeah, maybe. Maybe if you're like measuring something and you know that the measurement is le greater, less than the value and lesser, greater than the value. I don't know. I, I don't think there's many situations. Okay, so generally as a general rule, your error bars should be uh, symmetrical. I think that's it. Any questions about that? Does that tick off a few things that we'd sort of forgotten? Yeah? So again, the key change here is remembering exactly how to do those error bars, because we haven't spent a lot of time on that in year 11, okay? Making sure that we're actually measuring out that absolute uncertainty to find that error bar. Um, and introducing this idea of sometimes using a curved trend line. Now today, you guys are going to now go into, um, I'll actually stop the recording because that's sort of the end of that. Why is it yelling at me?